Welcome to this series of interviews with remaining Chisholm Hill Studios founding members. These interviews will form an audio archive illuminating Chisholm Hill Art Place's archive of photographs and is part of our commemoration of the 40 year anniversary of Chisholm Hill Art Place. In October 1980, a group of artists were granted guardianship of a derelict industrial building in Bow East London by the London Borough of Tower Hamlets. In return for use of the building and cheap rent, the artists were charged with the repair of the building in order to create affordable individual artist studios, a dance space, gallery and an educational program for the local community. The image on screen depicts those very early days in 1980, shortly after the work had begun. This interview is with abstract painter and founding member Nigel O'Neill. The image on screen is Untitled Print 2, 2018. It's a five color screen print and it's part of a limited edition of 50 prints. Nigel completed his master's in fine art at Goldsmiths College, the University of London. Since then, he's exhibited in many exhibitions, including the Royal Academy Summer Exhibitions 2008 to 2018. His work is represented in many collections, including Paul Smith LTD in London, Amsterdam and New York. And previously, he's been commissioned by Coca-Cola. The image on screen is an image of three works by Nigel that are approximately six foot high on display during uh, a previous Chisholm Hill Open Studios weekend. Nigel has very kindly selected three images from the Chisholm Hill archive to discuss his memories of the early days of Chisholm Hill Art Place. The first of which is an image of the gallery on the ground floor, I imagine, shortly after the original artists were granted permission to use the building. What are your memories of that time, Nigel, and why did you select this particular image? Right, hello. This is um, a photograph of the ground floor, the state of a building when we moved in. It's looking towards the canal side of the building. If you look on the right hand side, you see a dark shape, which is a shutter to the old lift shaft there. And next to it, the area where the office now is, gallery office now is. I selected this photograph because it shows the state of the building when we moved in. I think where the photographer standing, there was a lorry load of shoes in the building. I also want to go back to how we got to this stage. I had a studio that was Wharf for a short time in 79. And during that period, um, the artist was served an eviction from the property company, town and city, who wanted to redevelop the site. I remember attending a meeting um, where the artists came together to decide how they could continue their practice and establish their studios. Um, one artist there, um, Morris Ages, suggested that we should form ourselves into a cooperative, which was to become the Butler's Wolf Association, later to become Chisnell Art Place Limited. Um, his idea of a structure was that each member should have a vote in the company so we didn't get caught out again by a property company. Um, so he proposed this structure where everybody had de democratic say and there was a committee set up. And then the search for a building started and this property, 64 to 84 Chisholm Hill Road was found. The first, one of the first jobs we had was to reglaze the windows. Um, it was in a terrible state when we got there. There was no electricity, no water, and it had been open to the elements for many, many years. Um, we achieved a very favourable lease from Tower Hamlets Council with a rent free period of five years in exchange for renovating the building. Um, we also so had um, the mayor of Tower Hamlets Council, 
was actually on our first board of directors as well. So the council were very supportive in our efforts to refurbish this building into an arts com complex. Moving on to the second image that you've selected, Nigel, it depicts an artist standing on a ladder while in the process of building her studio. How was the work divided between everyone? And was it each for their own or did each one help one? Right, hello again. Um, this is um, like an artist building her studio. One of the first jobs, as I said previously, was to get the building watertight in place, all the windows. Um, after the building was watertight, it was a, um, artists were asked what their requirements were in terms of studio, in, in terms of studio space, how much space they wanted, which side of the building they wanted to be on, which floor, etc. Um, so after all those requirements were sort of put into the mix, a floor plan was drawn up and delineated literally with chalk lines on the floor. I should say that the three floors of the building were completely open at this point and um, a six foot corridor was taken out of the north side of the building. So the studios on the north side are six foot shorter than on the south side of the building. Um, once people had their space delineated, they started to work on their own, own space, building, building the space with breeze blocks. Um, there was a mammoth task of shifting breeze blocks up the stairs. It was quite medieval, sort of a chain gang almost, of shifting stuff up the stairs because we had no, there was no, well, there was a lift, but it didn't work. So, I mean, and this image shows um, an artist building her studio with the door frame in place there. I think the studio she's working on is a one currently occupied by De Mahoney at present time. You can see there's a wooden door frame there in place. Now, during this time, we thought that the corridors would be quite dark. So there's going to be a section of the door frame was going to be glazed because we worried that it was going to be dark. So there's wild glass put in the one section of the top section of the door. Um, also, there was a bit of a crisis when we had an event on the ground floor. We had a fire inspection and we had a very sort of um, jobs worth of a fire officer come and inspect the building. And we had to install fire doors. You would have this is the corridor, you see halfway down now there are fire doors um, just past the ladder, there are now double fire doors. And one fiddly thing was that a beading around the fire doors had to measure exactly exactly one inch, um, which is not commercially available because commercially available um, one inch wood is actually claimed down, so it's more like seven eighths, but this person went around with a tape measure checking, so we had to replace all the beading around the doors. Initially, artists um, put in two days a week building work for the organisation, either working in their own space or working on our communal areas. We even had little signing in shots, we even had little signing in sheets to record how many days everybody did on the building. These work days became known as communal days and went on for quite a few years. Well, at least the first two years, I think. Um, after people had built their studios, um, there was a building electricity to supply, which involved um, everybody having an extension lead coming out of their studio to the end of a corridor where the building supply was and plugging in. You have to be very careful not to overload this system. Um, it refused blue quite often, normally about five o'clock when it was just about getting dark and everybody felt like having a cup of tea and invariably it would fuse at this time and it'd be sort of a bit of a meeting with torches and stuff to try and sort it, sort it out. 
Um, eventually, we did get eventually we did get a proper electricity supply installed in the building, um, most of which is still there actually, which is quite old now. Yeah. Also, various building teams were set up at the time. Um, I think there was decoration, maintenance, um, and various other ones. I think I was involved in maintenance team. I specifically remember organising the steel doors on the front door, the steel doors on the back of the front door of the building, and getting somebody to bolt those on and weld, weld them together, because it was, fabric of the front door was quite fragile and we wanted something more secure. We also got a bigger letterbox installed so I had to get the slides posted back to them because this time it wasn't digital, it was you physically had to send your slides off to somebody. Do you mind if I ask a question, Nigel? No, that's fine. I'm just wondering about, um, obviously there's uh, 40 um, members in the studios at present, I believe. I think that's right. Um, and obviously there's some people who are uh, kind of subletting and sharing. I'm just wondering how many, how, was was there a similar number of um, artists involved at the outset? I think there's a list, I think there's a list, um, there's a book called, there's a leaflet called Banking on the Arts, there's a list of founder members in there. I think it was, I think it was one artist first, it was actually one artist first studio. I think there's two people sharing upstairs, but I think it, there weren't the same numbers, sharers and so forth. So the number of studios more or less corresponded to the number of artists. And was there additional individuals that were charged with um, setting up the dance space in the gallery or? The dance space wasn't available for the first six months, um, but uh, the artist took on making the whole building waterproof because I remember specifically glazing in the dance space, glazing windows in the dance space. So it's seen a, it's so much communal effort to get the whole building watertight and people work together. There's a very strong communal feeling. Um, there's even somebody even set, set up a canteen or cafe in what is now Kevin Harrison space where sausage and chips and stuff were made for the workforce, because it was in the winter, because it started October um, 1980, and it went through that winter as well. And um, so there's very much a communal feeling to the building, because everybody was working as a team on the building. And then after hard days, slog, we retired to the local local pub, which is no longer there, the Earl of Ellesmere for a few pints. Was that on Chisholm Hill Road? Yes, it's, um, if you stand by the front door, it's across the road, past the school, on the right-hand side. As I think that's now been converted into flats, is that, am I right in thinking? Yeah, that's just, that was some time ago. Yeah, yeah. And also, I, I have heard anecdotally that um, the because all the windows had been smashed when mm. you moved in, but um, you managed to get quite a lot of uh, recycled glazing uh, donated, um, and some of that glazing still uh, in the building. And apparently, in some studios, there's uh, black images, lined images on some of the panes of glass, and that. Yeah, I think that might have been some work from an art. I think that might have been some work from an artist. I'm not sure. But a lot the windows which are dappled of the original or windows, glass in the windows which is dappled is the original glass in the building. It's the original glass which is in the building. I don't know if there's a few panes of that left, I think. Um, but removing those panes is very difficult because the putty is really hard. So the main thing about glazing a window was getting the putty out with mostly hand tools. So putting the glass in, putting the putty in wasn't so much of a problem as actually getting the old glass out of windows, which is more difficult. And would that have been the most labour intensive or uh, task that was carried out or was just 
there's something else that was much more demanding and took much longer to um, complete. The demanding thing was building the, building the police block walls. I mean, first, as I said, there was no lift in the building whatsoever. Well, there was a lift, but it was downstairs and it didn't work. So the most labour-intensive thing was getting the police blocks up, upstairs, especially if you were on the third floor. Um, we did hire something a bit later on, a couple of months in, we did hire something called a Zambocker, which is like a conveyor belt, which took bricks up to the third, up to the roof, so they could be then taken down to the third floor, which was easier than carting them up three flights of floors. Um, I mean, basically, it's, our lives are concrete dust and breeze blocks for three months or more. You said that individual artists were were charged with obviously building their own space once it had been mapped out on the floor in chalk. Mm. Um, and then, you mean, at that point, was each individual artist just really concerned in finishing their studio or were there those common days you mentioned earlier on where artists still expected to give um, a day a week or two days a week outside of building their own studio to actually complete um, renovations your, to the building and making it watertight, et cetera? Um, basically, building your own studio was seen as part of building a studio in the building. So it's seen as part of the, your time and communal building. Um, it was all, you, you mean somebody might help you build your studio as well, because I say there's a very much a communal feel to it. Because um, I think my neighbour helped me build my wall in my studio as well, I seem to remember. So it wasn't, a, the idea was to divide the building from pre open floors into studio space. And where did the money come from all of this? Because you mean yeah. obviously buying breeze blocks and, and you mean electricity and food for the workers and renting equipment and right. mortar, all that sort of stuff costs money. Yeah. We initially we had five years rent free. However, the artists were paying the artists were paying a subscription to begin with, and later a rent a rent based on the size of the studio they had. So that money was used to buy breeze blocks. I also seem to remember we've got um, we got a grant from, I think we got a studio conversion grant from the Arts Council. I'm not absolutely sure on that. Um, the doors, the white, the white melamine doors, I know were donated by a company called Crosby Doors. So there was very bits, those bits of sponsorship for building materials as well. But like I say, everybody was contributing money on a weekly basis to help buy materials. And there was some sponsorship and I think there was an Arts Council convert, due to conversion grant. And was Crosby Doors, was that a local East End company or was, was how did that come about? I can't remember, I just remember the name. Excellent. Oh, also another thing, on the building the walls. I think the fire officer also insisted that we had to have battening at the top of the walls, screwed into the ceiling, so the walls didn't move. Um, so there's sort of four by, I think it's four by two beams, screwed into the ceiling and screwed into the wall. So you've got the walls, top of the wall is sandwiched between two pieces of wood. Now I know that I know that timber came from, that was salvage timber, which came from a wood yard or salvage yard around the back of my land somewhere. So, understand what I mean? The walls are actually sandwiched together at the top. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. I didn't realise that. Well, I mean, people have, like myself have put up, um, put up uh, panelling. Mm. But that was one of the requirements of a building. Also, another thing about building, um, you know, notice that some some studios have half a window, and that the end of a wall which butts against a window is glazed. Um, my studio is one in particular, and it's like that. It's based on some people didn't want a whole two windows, but they needed more 
more than one day, so a day and a half. So it's decided that for appearance on the outside, it would be better to have a glass division rather than a wall going up in the middle of a window. That's not the case in all the studios now. I, I imagine some changes have taken place. So for example, the studio I'm in at the moment, um, that's one of those bay and a half studios on the north side, on the third floor. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the wall that the what the the wall that actually goes up to the the window. Ah, uh, right. Okay, but that's one. I think that's one which was divided, wasn't it? Yeah. I can't quite. Who was in that studio before you? I can't. Um, quite. Before myself uh, was Anfritha was um, Alicia Paz, and I'm not sure who was there before Alicia. I think that might have been a large studio, which uh, I think two founder members decided they wanted to share. I think that might have been a large studio. And then when they left, I think that was probably done then. Oh, uh, okay. So the partition was put in after. All right. I think. And do you know which founding members were in that studio? Just curious. I'm not certain. Um, no, um, maybe Kathy Mullenith and Lucy Jones. Maybe. But I'm not okay. sure. I'm not sure on that. I'm just curious. But thanks. Um, should we move on to the third image, Nigel, or do you want to? Yeah. Okay. The third image you selected, Nigel, depicts yourself in your completed studio. Do you know what year the photograph was taken, and can you remember it being um, being taken? Well, this is um. I know that this photograph was taken in 1982 because I remember my work from then. I I don't know who took the photograph. Um, but this shows my studio, Studio 10, on the first floor, which is on the north side of the building, which is a studio which I still occupy today. However, the configuration is slightly different, as I had to remove the wall with the window in for fire regulation purposes. Um, but this is a studio I've always occupied in the building. I designed the studio in terms of width, in terms of how far I could stand back and photograph a painting, really. So I didn't want this to be too expensive. So I decided that 15 feet was about a, a usable width for the studio. Um, of course, having been now 40 years, the studio is now rather fuller than it is now, really. That's quite interesting. I didn't actually appreciate that, that you'd actually design the studio based on the minimal amount of space required to actually compose a photograph of your work. Yeah, and to stand back and to view the work. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Did many artists um, adopt a similar approach to uh, designing their spaces, or was that just something that, was, um, that you did yourself? If you design something 10 foot wide, it wouldn't be quite big enough. So what, in terms of what event was then, I designed something which I could afford and was usable, uh, really. Did other artists adopt a similar kind of rationale for designing their spaces or that you're well, aware so, of? Um, because they were fairly cheap. Some artists sort of almost wanted half the second floor. <laughs> you'll, you'll notice on the second floor, there's a couple of very large studios, or well, I think there's only one very large studio now, but, um, but I think that my studio is about the average size of the fort. I said, like I said before, the studios on the south side are six foot longer because the corridor is taken out from the north side of the building because of... That was because of the corridor that was required in the middle of the... Um... Yeah. Between the north and the south facing studios. Okay. If you look on the if you look on the south side corridor, you'll see there's some brick columns, which happen, I think represent the centre of the building. So the corridor's taken out six foot from there. So on the south facing studios you'll see south facing corridor you'll see brick brick columns every so often. Under the beams, I think, actually, which mark the centre of the building. So, 
And you mentioned that the, the studio you're in at the moment is, is this studio. It's, you've been in the same studio for 40 years, which is, I mean, that's quite a considerable amount of time. Are there many of the founding members who are still in the studios? Are they still, many of them still in their original studios or has, are you one of the only uh, artists who've kind of stayed put in the, your original space? Um, just only a thing, there's at least one, two, I think it's about four members are still including my staff still in the original spaces. So about about half the the um, remaining founding members. Yeah, it's, it's, I think half is remaining is about seven, isn't it? Half the remaining founding members. Would you be able to talk a little bit about, you mean, what your studio has meant to you over the past forty years? Well, it's been very important for me to. I was lucky enough to be at Butler's Wharf at the time. I was lucky enough to be introduced to somebody at Butler's Wharf while I um, rented a space from. And I was keen to establish myself as an artist in East London. So it was extremely important to me to have a studio space. And I liked the whole concept, which was opposed that there's artist led and artist initiated. And to a greater degree, artists controlled of, yeah, what would happen. At about the same time, I managed to acquire a flat in East London as well, sort of within walking distance of the studio. Um, so it's been extremely important for me, and I hope it continues. Of course, my studio is a bit smaller now because I've accumulated a lot of work over 40 years. But it's been extremely important as a base for me to make my work and appreciate the um, criticisms of artists as well, especially in the beginning when we were, there was more of a communal atmosphere in the building um, because the work of the artists was very different, very different from each other, but there was interest and support from fellow artists. I mean, like I said, we had lunches and we met at the pub, you know, various parties and stuff. I think we actually had a post office van at one time, which has doubled as um, transport to parties and as well as moving materials around from suppliers. So, yes, it was very important to me and it still is very important. You spoke a little bit about the community, the original community that. Um built the studios really and set them up and instigated them. Um, and obviously over the course of four decades, people are going to come and go. Um, but I mean, outside of your actual studio, what has Chisnell Art Place meant to you over the past four decades? Like the, the institution, as it were? Well, I think the primary source, primary impulse from beginning has been to provide artists with affordable studio space, which is the main objective when we took on the building. All the other bits and pieces like gallery and education and dance space are plus. But I think it needs to remain as artist led and provide studio space for artists, which is increasingly rare supply in East London at affordable rents.